people. Uh, we're getting started. Uh, we're a few minutes late uh, because there were some complaints about the quality of the live stream, uh, but they should be fixed now, thanks to the wizardry of uh, Mr. Chin. So uh, next up is uh, Dan Heidegger, who's uh, JIT lead, I think, for... Uh, VM lead. VM lead. Yes. Uh, for, uh, for the J9 um, VM, and he will talk about the method handle implementation that IBM has done, and... Uh, I don't think it involves Lambda forms. No, it does not. <laughs> Woohoo! Go for it, Dan. So. All right. Uh, so, I'm Dan Heidinga. I work for IBM. Um, IBM has an independent implementation of Java. So, we have our own GC, JIT, VM, um, and core kernel classes. And in this particular case, that core includes all the method handle related classes. So, I'll talk a little bit today about. Um, our method handle compilation pipeline, what drives when your method handles get compiled and, and how they get compiled. Um, so of course I have my very friendly um, legal stream that my lawyers require me to, to show you that says that everything I tell you is a lie. I liked Remy's version, but uh, I, I don't get away with that. So there's the fun picture of me. Um, so why do you care that I'm talking about, uh, about 292? Well, I've been on the expert group um, and responsible for IBM's implementation of this. Um, and I've also used it uh, on the 335 expert group when we spec'd out Lambda. So method handle, as we already saw today, everybody in, or most of this room already knows about method handles. They're this great um, Java object that allows you to um, reference an underlying method, constructor, field, or other low-level thing, right? They're a way to emulate the invoke byte codes in Java or the get fields or put fields in Java. And then you get a whole bunch of these transformations. Um, great, you know, what do you do with this? Well, our early prototype of, of method handles had one class. We had method handle. Um, it had a kind field which told you what the operation was. It had a type field which told you what the method type for it was, which was the signature you invoke it under. And it had a VM slot in which we jammed various pieces of VM related data, you know, the address of the method, the V table offset, the I table offset. This worked great for the early prototypes when there were exactly like five kinds of method handles. Um, but as we went on, the, you know, you, you see that this runs into a lot of problems. Um, one of the major problems that you start to run into with this is JITs don't like to compile code based on instance fields. They really don't like to have to look at method handle and go read a field to tell you what the operation should be. Um, the second one is the standard maintenance problem. You end up with a giant ball of mud. Um, I don't like to, to, uh, <laughs> to implement code that deals with this or maintain it. So. <laughs> I was impressed as well. Yes, it is a very pretty ball of mud. I <laughs> so what do we have today? Well, we have a very rich uh, method handle uh, hierarchy. I don't actually expect anybody to read this. This is sort of how we've split out the different behaviors from method handles. All the different uh, combinators each have their own class. Um, and that means that each of these subclasses is smaller because they only hold on to the kind of data that you need. Um, the other great thing about this is now we've given the JIT a place to put specialized behavior. So it doesn't have to look at a kind field to tell you what to do. We've now got a class that can hold on to the right data and um, provide a place for us to implement templates. And these templates are going to tell the JIT what to do. Um, so once you have your method handle um, hierarchy, how do you use this? Well, as we've seen earlier, you build up these chains of method handles. Um, so I've got an example, I actually ripped this example out of, uh, more vaguely this example out of some early uh, JRuby code. So assuming that I've got a guard with test and I've got three helpers that are going to return me direct handles, I build up a guard with test handle, it's got pointers out to three other method handles. All right, and then maybe I want to have an insert arguments off to the side, who's got another direct handle, he's going to insert one thing. And maybe I join this together at a switch point. Um, the code I'm showing, of course, has got all the magic static imports that we've talked about that make the ugly 292 code slightly less ugly. Um, so with my switch point, I got a guard with test. Up on the top, I've got a dynamic invoker. That's a method handle that knows how to read um, the target out of a call site. Um, in this case, because it's a switch point, that call site is, or 
that call site will either point to true or false, so these are constant int handles in our world. Um, and so based on that switch point, you're either going to run the guard with test or the insert handle. And if I then wanted to install this at some invoke dynamic call site, I'd add some extra code here. So now I have a mutable call site that holds on to that uh, method handle and I get the dynamic invoker. And this is this big object graph or big chain that I'm going to run. So I know I said I was going to talk about uh, the compilation strategy, but to get there, I kind of have to talk a little bit about our interpreter. Um, so, you know, if I have a method handle chain that looks vaguely like this, where I've, you know, conveniently thrown away the guard, assuming that, you know, A is a guard with test handle, when I go to run this, I've got some set of operations or some set of arguments on the stack, you know, one, two, three, four, and A is my method handle. So I run the guard, I figure out which one I want to run, either B or C, and I replace A with the correct one. So now I've got C there with four arguments. Maybe C is a, um, a drop operation, so I you know, remove one of the arguments and I put D on the stack there. And then I look at that and say, hey, maybe this is a permute, so I reorder the arguments and then I replace it with E. Um, right, and then I continue on and do the same thing for F. So this is tail recursive. It means in the interpreter we don't grow stack frames when we're running method handles. Um, with a couple of caveats, right? There are um, filter return, for example, you need to have something to catch the return value. So there we cram an invisible frame on the stack that uh, will catch the return and run the new handle. All right, so, you know, that's our interpreter. Somehow we need to get from our interpreter into our compiler. So one of the abstractions that we added for this is a thunk tuple. So every method handle has a thunk tuple, um, and this thunk tuple holds on to two entry points. These are what lets us get from our interpreter into our compiled code. So the first entry point is the I to J, or interpreter to JIT, invoke exact thunk. It points to the start of whatever that compiled body is. And the second entry point is the invoke exact thunk. This is our JIT to JIT entry point. Um, and it points a little further down in the compiled code. And the reason for this is that the first entry point knows how to read the interpreter state, um, load it off the interpreter stack into registers, and then fall through into the, the JIT to JIT entry point. Um, so where do these thunk tuples and this compiled code come from? Well, each thunk tuple is implemented in terms of a bytecode template. Um, we call these thunk archetypes. So I'm showing you the, a slightly simplified version of the thunk archetype code for guard with test. Um, this code is written in terms of int. See, it returns an int. Um, the method name is invoke exact thunk archetype underscore x. The underscore x part tells our JIT not to care about any of the particular types and do the fix-ups. Um, and it takes an int placeholder, which we know how to rewrite at compile time with the particular method type um, for this method handle. Um, a lot of the code here is written in terms of ILGen macros. This is a class that we have that has a whole bunch of native methods. They have no implementation. They're only callable from inside javalang invoke. And they exist simply as uh, ILGen macros. So our JIT sees this and replaces them with the appropriate intermediate language trees to do the operations. So for example, the first one here is ILGen macros dot invoke exact underscore Z that says, hi, you know, run a method handle. It's going to return you a Boolean. It's going to take ILGen macros dot first N, which says at compile time, figure out how many of the arguments of this um, method handle you're going to pass to the guard. Um, and we figured that out using num guard args, which is actually implemented here on the guard with test class. And the reason for this is it's specific to guard with tests, so we crammed it there instead of IL gens. Um, and then, you know, based on the return value of this, we're either going to run the true target or the, or the false target. Um, you know, so this is some fairly generalized templated code. This is good enough to get us out of the interpreter, which is important, um, but it's basically the equivalent of compiling a single invoke virtual instruction. Right? This is your template JIT. It's not going to do a very good job. It's like you're running compiled bytecodes. Sorry. When I say that, I don't mean a compiled method. I mean you've compiled each bytecode and you're jumping from them. So that's, you know, it's enough to get you out of the interpreter. Good. Not enough to get you where you want to be. And you know, with the picture I've been showing, we've got a lot of duplicated code. 
um, assuming that each of these three method handles are identical, um, they each point to a thunk tuple, that thunk tuple points to compiled code. If we're going to model things this way, then I don't need that thunk tuple. I could just have the method handle directly point to the compiled code. Um, it would save a level of indirection, which is always you know, somewhere we want to be, but it means there'd be you know, less opportunity to share code. And really, that's what we want to do here. We want to find some way to share this simplized or simple first form code. So the picture we want looks a little bit more like this. So method handles that are common or can be shared all point to the same thunk tuple. And that thunk tuple then points to the code. Great. So you know, we've cut down on the amount of code cache we're using to do this, but we're still, you know, how are we mapping from method handle to thunk tuple? Well, each of our method handle subclasses has a thunk table. And this is a table that uh, maps from some set of shareability criteria um, to the actual underlying thunk tuple. So for example, for regard with test, what we care about is the upcast signature. And when I say upcast signature, I mean we don't care about if you wanted, you know, um, string string. We're going to upcast all of those to objects. So the only things we care about are objects and primitives where we've upcasted anything smaller than int to int because they all have the same compiled code. Um, the extra piece here is that it's not just the incoming signature or the method type that you use to invoke the method handle under. We actually care about some extra piece of data. In this particular case, the arguments that you pass to the guard. So if your guard only takes two of the arguments that, you were, that your full method handle takes, um, that'll get a different chain or a, a different thunk tuple than somebody who took all of them. Um, so there's a small amount of specialization in these, but they're pretty, um, pretty simplified code. And again, it, the goal of this is get us out of the interpreter and don't waste code cache. Um, so some of the other things that we use to manage sharing are something like an as type operation, which has the incoming type and the outgoing type. Um, we upcast the incoming type because we assume that any cast from object to an underlying type is going to be equivalent. Um, but that final destination type, we can't upcast in any way. All right, so I've talked a bit about you know, getting into compiled code, but what are the actual compilation states that we deal with? How do we transition between these different states? And how do we get from you know, what I've been referring to as pretty stupid code to the fast code that we want to be running? Well, our first set of code in these thunk tuples is shared thunks. Um, this is sort of the dumb code that gets us out of the interpreter. And then the other two states we have are custom thunks or inlined. Um, custom thunks and inlined are basically the same thing. It's just whether it's rooted in a method handle or it's been inlined or not. Um, and although I'm showing this diagram as these are the state transitions, there's actually a couple of other theoretical state transitions that you will never see. It's possible to go straight from interpreted to inlined, but it requires some ugliness with the mutable call site sync all at exactly the right time. All right, so the initial JIT compilation. Um, we're going from interpreted to our shared thunk, so we're going to compile that thunk archetype, and we're going to get into compiled code. So what's our algorithm for this? Um, well, first we check, are you already compiled? If you're not, we increment an invocation count. Um, if your count is greater than the threshold, say 25, we request to compile. Um, and if we're able to compile that immediately, we jump back to the jitted code or we jump straight to the jitted code. And otherwise, the interpreter runs it and we wait until our thunk archetype gets updated. And the next time you try and run this method handle, um, you're going to run the, the compiled code. So all, comp all compiles are asynchronous. You stick them in a compilation queue and wait for them to become available. Sometimes they become available fast enough that you can just run the compiled code. Right, so the, the problem with this initially was we had our invocation counts on method handle, and this was causing some delays to get out of the interpreter. Um, with a count of, of 25 to trigger a compile, it meant you could run three different method handles that had the same shared code uh, 24 times each. Um, in this example, and you'd still be running the interpreter, which is way more than we want. So what we ended up doing was the interpreter does its counting on the thunk tuple object, um, right? Because here we've seen, eventually you hit 25, you request compile, great. But you know, you've done a whole bunch of pointless interpreter execution. 
what we really want is the picture to look like this, where, hey, you know, the interpreter has done its counting on the thunk tuple. Um, and this is actually the only reason that the thunk tuple has a count. It's our shared guy. We want to get him compiled as quickly as possible. So the interpreter does all its counting there. Great, you know, so you run interpreted for a little while and then you hit um, your threshold and then you request the compile. Um, well, unless you're running compiled code. So the theory we have is that anytime you're in the JIT, you want to stay in the JIT. Um, and if you're running a method handle from JITed code, it must be because it's going to become hot if it's not hot already. So if you're running in compiled code here and you see an invoke handle bytecode, which is one of our internal bytecodes for handling um, method handle invocation, uh, I have two versions of it, invoke handle and invoke handle generic. So um, when you hit the invoke handle, um, we would have to transition from the JIT to the interpreter, and this tends to be expensive. You have to marshal the JIT state, you have to save things away, have to build the appropriate frames, and then transition to your slow execution engine. So on any attempt to, comp um, to run a method handle from compiled code, we immediately request to compile for that method handle. And if that compile can complete quickly enough, then we will jump back to JITed code. So we will abort the transition which means that the first time you take an interpreted method handle chain and try and run it from JITED code, you'll see a bunch of aborted transitions. So it tries to jump to, um, to the interpreter, says, oh, I can compile that, and comes back. It says, oh, I can compile that, and comes back. So the first time, it's, you get a bit of staggered performance, but everything after that, you, know, you get a nice consistent, um, consistent shared thunk um, speed, which is still not optimal code. Right, so that's shared thunks, that's what drives getting out of the interpreter. Now it's time to look at how do we customize things. So a custom thunk is something we compile when we want to ignore our shareability criteria. When we want to take an entire method handle chain and we want to collapse it down into a single jitted body. Um, and one of the benefits of this is that uh, we can throw away a lot of code. There's a lot of code in method handles that doesn't matter. And when you're able to see the entire picture, you're able to throw it away because it's basically dead. Um, and why do we do custom thunks for two reasons? Um, at an invoke dynamic call site or some other place where we're trying to inline a method handle or when a method handle be chain becomes hot enough but can't be inlined for some reason. So this is where we start looking at um, if an individual method handle shared thunk is like a, a bytecode, then the entire chain is like compiling an entire method at once. So here we're looking at our shared thunks, and we jump to the compiled code for the first guy. We do whatever operations we need to do, and we jump to the compiled code for the second guy, and you know, on and on and on, and then eventually we return. But this is horrible for our instruction cache because we're doing cache misses, and it's it's uh, you know we're running the equivalent of compiled bytecodes. This is not what we want. What we want is a picture that looks like this and says, hey, I have this method handle graph. It's got one piece of compiled code, and we're going to run that. So we've got you know, no jumps all over the instruction cache here. We usually have less code in the custom thunk because we've been able to uh, run whatever optimization passes we can on it. Um, and you've now got something that's specific for that handle. So. We use invocation counts to drive requesting custom thunks. I'm going to kind of ignore the inline case because it's pretty obvious. It's where you've got an invoke dynamic in a method that you're compiling, and you want to inline that method handle chain into that method. Great, that's going to get you the equivalent of a custom thunk, um, and it's going to take into, into account the state of the method it's being compiled into. So let's talk a little bit about custom thunks that live on their own. Um, and in this case, straight up invocation counts are not enough. Um, if I naively count in my shared thunks every time I run a method handle, um, the method handle invocation counts are all going to increase in lockstep. So I'm going to increment the count on A, I'm going to increment the count on C, I'm going to increment the count on D, I'm going to increment the count, right, and on and on and on. So as I go along, I finally hit my threshold to request a custom thunk on A, and then I go to run C and I say, hey, great, you've hit your threshold, let's request a custom thunk. And then I do it to D. 
and I do it to E, and I do it to F. So I've got a whole bunch of these custom thunks all queued up, and now I'm wasting all kinds of time compiling custom thunks that are never going to be run. Because once the compile for A completes, that's the guy you're going to run, and the others are basically dead code littering up my code cache that I can't clean up. And the reason I can't clean it up is the method handle graph is still alive, and I have no way to know that you didn't really mean that you wanted a custom func starting at C or a custom func starting at D. I don't know that you haven't installed that method handle somewhere else. So I'm stuck with a whole bunch of wasted code cache. Uh, so custom thunk is where I've taken an entire method handle graph and I have compiled it down into a single jitted body. And I've got uh, invocation counts. So the invocation count drives the request. Um, and we're, you know, n not only am I wasting code cache and spending time compiling this, but I might be delaying compiles that actually matter to your application. So you know, I'm doing all these custom thunk compilations, and if I could stop doing those and do you know this other compile, your application would be 10% faster. So you know, I've been calling these co um, compilation storms. So how do we avoid these things? Well, we have to play with how we do our counting. Um, so one of the things we've had to play with is the idea of where we do our counting. We want, at the end of the day, when we have a custom thunk, we don't want to see any of the, uh, the counting still happening when we're running that custom thunk. So that means I can't do my counting from my jitted code that's going to request this thunk. I have to do the counting in the shared thunk itself. Um, so what each shared thunk does is it increments its own count, and it decrements the count of the next guy it's going to run. So A says plus myself minus C. C says plus myself minus D, and we, you know, we move down this list like this. So what we actually end up seeing here is that only A is going to ever get um, a, a positive count. That means that only A is ever going to be um, in queued for compilation, which is good. It means I've, ad I've accurately identified the head of my method handle chain. And I'm go only going to compile a custom func for that full chain. It means I've avoided my compile storm. I haven't wasted my code cache. Right? These are all the things we want. But it does mean that I have no way of identifying a common subchain. So if there were a bunch of other method handle graphs, that all pointed at you know the tail D E E D E F. I can't compile that as a single common body, which may or may not be a problem. We haven't actually found a case where you particularly care about doing that. Um, so this gets you custom thunks, um, and this is your equivalent of full method compiles. The other interesting game we play here is that we have the interpreter decrement the counts before it goes to run one of these things. And the reason we do that is we don't want the interpreter to drive custom thunks. We want our compilation to exceed, um, to move like a wave through jitted code. So if you're in jitted code, you can get to a custom thunk. If you're running something from the interpreter, you're only ever going to get shared thunks. So one of the pieces of uh, advice everybody always gives out is avoid method handles invoke. Um, and the reason this is given out is that invoke acts as though it called as type, which creates a new method handle and then does invoke exact on it. And that's pretty much our implementation. And I bet you Hotspot does something similar, at least it used to. Um, <laughs> so the reason we say to avoid this is it means every time you do invoke, you're going to create a new as type handle, and we're going to do our custom counting on that. So you create this new as type, you get your count, and then you, you know, continue in shared thunks down the, the chain. So we said this kind of sucks because people are doing this, so let's add a one element cache to every method handle. So every method handle, when you do an as type on it, it saves the last value you as typed to. So at least if you're consistently using the same incoming signature, you will get your custom body. But if you're using 
invoke with multiple signatures, you're going to defeat that cache. Um, you know, it's a fairly brittle optimization. It gets us, you know, most of the cases, but somebody who's using a lot of different signatures is still going to be stuck in, in slow land. Um, so that's sort of the, the main point on how we drove our method handle compilation pipeline. The other piece we looked at was, you know, when you're running method handle code, um, how can we optimize this? So rather, sorry, go ahead. They share the same, provided the incoming signature can be upcast to the same object primitive combination and the target um, is the same, you will get the same shared thunk. So you'll get the same um, sort of slow jitted code, but you won't get into optimized code. So you won't get the custom thunk, you won't get the single body for it. And you have on that handle handle. Yes, we, we do the shared thunk counting on the, the shared thunk, and then each method handle has to maintain its own counts because we couldn't do custom counting on the thunk tuple because we wouldn't know which handle chain to apply it to. So, uh, shared thunk, thunk sharing doesn't help here at all. No. It, it gets you not running the interpreter, but doesn't actually get you where you want to be. So we looked at a series of static optimizations. Um, what can we do at method handle creation time to make things faster at runtime? And we too stole things from old small talk papers and old Java papers, the idea of super byte codes. Is anyone familiar with this? The idea is that uh, you want to get your interpret. A lot of your time in an interpreter is spent dispatching bytecodes. Um, so you lose it to your dispatch loop. If you can look at combinations of bytecodes that occur frequently enough and rewrite them, you then save the dispatch. So we looked for what particular method handle operations occur one after each other all the time, and how can we optimize these? How can we give you a better method handle graph so it's, you know, fewer objects um, or more optimized opti uh, operations? So the cases we actually ended up with um, were things like drop and constant. Um, because we're writing thunk archetypes, which are basically Java methods, they're great at throwing away their arguments and returning some value. So there's no reason for us to give you two objects in this graph. We'll just give you one. It's a little more work on the interpreter, but who cares? That's not where you're going to be spending your time. The other case we looked at was permutes. Um, so if you do permutes, on top of each other, there's no reason that you can't just merge those down into a single permute. And that's not just permutes. We also said, well, drop is basically a permute, so implement it as permute, and then they merge as well. Um, and the final case is any combination of inserts, permutes, drops, and a limited set of as types, um, we can combine that into a single handle that we call the argument mover handle, which was one of those, give it some crappy name to get started, and never got fixed. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. So the as type that it's allowed to do are um, boxing and unboxing, and um, now I'm drawing a blank, and integer widening. So it can do some basic boxing, unbox elimination for you. So that's sort of you know what you look at when you've done your, your method handle compilation and some of the static optimizations we've done. Um, the other game we've played in a lot of places is this one element cache. Um, so as type takes makes use of a well ele one element cache. The other op operation that does is um, varargs collectors. Because anytime you go to invoke those, um, the as type operation will actually allocate a new collector for you. And so we cache that as well. So, you know, what are we going to look at next for this? Um, 
Well, J9 has a form of AOT, so we can do some ahead of time compilation for you using our shared classes cache. Um, this is an option you run with that says, I'm going to preload a bunch of classes into this cache off to the side and uh, you know, save on actually loading them off disk. One of the benefits of that is that we can then say, hey, if your classes are in that cache, we can AOT some code for you. Um, and we're looking at how to put our shared thunks in there so that you wouldn't run in the interpreter at all. Um, we're also looking for additional super handles like the drop and constant. Um, as I mentioned in the last point, I have a UH, uh, UNB University of New Brunswick um, PhD candidate who's looking at uh, data mining method handle chains out of JRuby applications um, and NASHorn applications to see what are the, the operations that come in common enough that we could find ways to cache them. Um, we're also looking at how to speed up our method handle compilations. Right now, because of the way we do our IL generation for them, it's they're slower than they need to be. And so we're looking at how do we make these smaller and faster. And, you know, again, as type is a perennial problem, so we're looking at how do we make that work better. Now I have a couple of slides that my employer has asked me to show. Um, if anybody is interested in a GoPro, you know, the IBM booth has, uh, has a, uh, uh, a competition where you can uh, build a Bluemix application. Um, there is a innovation challenge coming up, a uh, website link there if you want more details. And if you're a startup and you're interested in uh, IBM credits, then, uh, you know, some links here as well. Any questions? Frederick has a question. So first I would like to say that invoke using as type to create the exact method handle was uh, supposed to be just a means of specification. It was never meant to be actually implemented. And it wasn't implemented in JRocket. So that's <laughs> my first <laughs> <laughs> statement. Next, my question. Uh, would this kind of example actually be compiled and optimized in J9? Imagine that you have a huge matrix, a million times a million, and you create work pack chunks uh, using method handles that are dispatched to a thread framework of some sort. And each work packet encodes the range of the matrix inside the top method handle. So you have a one method handle with the actual work that it's going to do, but the data to supply to that method handle is encoded in the next method handle that calls that method handle. So you get these, uh, uh, the range of the matrix encoded in the method handle chain, which would mean that if I understand your implementation correctly, it is theoretically possible that for certain ranges of the matrix calculation, there might be beneficial uh, combinations of the input range with the actual calculation that, for example, a certain range of the matrix, some values always go down to zero, so all multiplications go down to zero. Would it be possible for J9 to create uniquely yitted code for that range of the matrix that's significantly more optimized? Would it be possible? Um, we would... <laughs> We would certainly be able to create a custom thunk for that, um, which means we would be able to optimize the that constant range. I'm not sure if we'd be able to detect that that always goes to zero or not. Um, but well if that, that depends on how the optimizing compiler sees. The yes. Code. So it's that's yeah. I, but yeah. as long as you feed the compiler everything, including the range, you have the opportunity. I think. Yes. Cool. Excellent. I would say this is a, um, a good example of the customization problem. You, and part of the problem with customizations is you want to uh, share code uh, and use it more than once, which means 
you probably want to have some of the data values that are available to you the first time you run a customized method handle to be empty placeholders in your compiled code and other aspects of the method handle you want to be hardwired into the compiled code and optimized fully. Um, and in my mind, it's an, it's an open problem how to robustly separate between what parts of your method handle chain should be treated like data and what parts of the method handle chain should be treated like code. The cheat we've done so far has been that fields inside method handles that are marked as final get inlined into the code and anything that isn't gets treated as data. Uh, I wanted to clarify, you said that there there was at least one case where you try to force a request to compile immediately, uh, like if it's bound into an invoke dynamic instruction. Is that what I, am I understanding uh, correctly? No, on a JIT transition. So um, if you're running in compiled code and you're going to run an interpretive method handle, we will request the, the shared thunk compile immediately. Okay, okay. Uh, that I, I understood then. Because that, that fits what I basically want handles to do that I'm binding in Ruby code. If I bind something into a call site that's going to be, because it's always going to be from, in my, my terms, jitted code. It's going to be coming from uh, byte code that I've generated. It's going to hit the invoke dynamic. It's going to have a handle chain. I, I want that handle chain to be compiled at that point, to some level. And, and in this case, it would be um, getting rid of the lambda forms, turning it into at least JVM byte code at that point, rather than waiting for however many calls at that call site for it to turn into bytecode. So that would be nice. The other thing is being able to asynchronously do those and possibly toss some of those compiles out. Um, we, uh, I'm sure that I'm seeing compile storms of method handles too on the way that it's done right now. So thank you very much for a very detailed presentation. I, if I have uh, seen it before, it would save me uh, many hours <laughs> or even maybe even weeks of my time. So my question is about profiling. So you have a customized uh, uh, songs and shared songs. Uh, do you profile per on per method handle basis uh, uh, in shared songs to uh, to uh, produce uh, uh, optimized code for customized case? We haven't done any profiling yet on method handle chains. So it's one of the, the other future directions we're looking at is what's the right way to do that profiling. Um, my initial thought is that we would use the shared thunks and update profile data on the actual method handle. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was extremely detailed and uh, Everyone appreciated it a lot, I'm sure. Maybe Frederick has five minutes because you're short on time to speak about how we did method handles. Well, if you don't want to. Yeah, come on. Come on. No, we didn't have any time. JRocket did not have an interpreter, so what we did was uh, that Kalle Wielund and I implemented method handle invoke that entered the C runtime and did anything it had to do inside the C runtime to reach the smallest level of method handle. And then we expressed the other method handles using this method handle. This meant that the original call was quite slow. But as soon as we detected that it was called more than once, we compiled the chain as uh, Daniel uh, describes here. That was what we wanted to do. However, we did not do at that time the really cool stuff that Dan describes that J9 is doing, which is to inline into a me method handle as an inline root. We didn't have time to do that. So we always inlined into the function where the method handle was called through an uh, invoke dynamic. But uh, what's really cool with J9 here is that you can pick any instance of a method handle and that becomes a unique inlining route yes. for a whole chain of code. And that's so amazing. 
well, it fixes a lot and it Im opens up uh, an enormous amount of possibilities. And we didn't do that in the rocket, Ray rocket because we only had two weeks to implement JSR 292, which we did. Uh, we but we didn't have to implement an interpreter walking stack and thingy because we didn't have one. Yes, but clearly what we would want it to go the way that Dan has shown that it's possible to go. Um, so if I had had implemented J uh, JSR 292 in a JVM with an interpreter, I would try to avoid the interpreter <laughs> and just jump into any slow case code in the runtime and then uh, as quickly as possible spend the time optimizing the method handle as described here and either injecting it into the call site or keeping it alive. So in my personal opinion, uh, making a speedy interpreter that speedily, <laughs> in quotation mark, as an interpreter speeds through the method handles is a waste of time. Jump to the compiler immediately. Thank you. Yep, so we're all very impressed with this. Thank you, Dan. Um, we have 10 minutes or so before it's the turn. Shall we take a coffee break?